It's time for another edition of the Dodcast. Today, Drew Douglas talks with legendary Washington Post columnist Thomas Boswell. How are you doing today, Mr. Boswell? Uh, doing great. The weather is beautiful here in Washington. It looks like it's going to be that way the rest of the week for uh, games 3, 4, and 5 of the National League Championship Series. It ought to be a, a Dodger Nats game. It ought to have great weather. <laughs> yeah, if only. Um... <laughs> Yeah, hopefully next year. There is always next year, as Cubs fans said for 108 years. Well, I think uh, Washington fans have been saying that in a number of uh, sports since about uh, 1992. So uh, we're not running it up uh, like 108 years. We're kind of doing it 25 years at a time in four different sports. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a rough life being a DC sports fan. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different way to have a hundred years of misery. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, uh, you'll know that with the Cubs or the Red Sox, you know, they had those huge long droughts. Um, some, you know, relatively few people experience a hundred more years of losses. <laughs> there may not be a single human who endured at all. My father-in-law, who pitched up the Triple A for the Red Sox, was born in 1920. And so he actually was aware of the Red Sox, I guess, by 1928 or something. So he did endure you know, about 75 years of one of those streets. But there is a generation of people like my son, who's 30, um, who really have gone through a period where mm -hmm. they became aware of sports in six or seven or eight, like my adult son did. Uh, it's now like 22, 23 years times four sports. <laughs> it, it's beginning to feel... Uh, bordering on more than unfair that nobody here not only doesn't win a title I mean you, you don't expect to win a whole lot of world titles in this sport that has 30 or 20 or 30 or 32 games in this sport but you kind of like to get to the finals for the Super Bowl or World Series or we're barring that at least the final four you know in 25 years out of four different sports uh, and that's that's only happened once here in the last 25 years if the Nats are left guilty but, but it is adding up. It's, uh, it's taking a toll. Uh, fans here are really having to analyze why they're fans, what it is that satisfies them, what frustrates them, how do they cope with it, and how do they not become destructive fans who sort of tear up uh, fairy good teams that don't quite get where they want them to go. Yeah, it's a heck of a lot of fun watching the Nats for 162 games in the regular season, but man, once you hit October, it's, it sure is rough, it feels like. Um, one of the ways I think about it is, um, I don't know whether the term comes from one of the social sciences or from one of the real hard sciences, but they say that some events are over-determined. You may think of a match at Wimbledon where they play five sets and play for hours and put the ball back and forth at each other, you know, God knows how many hundreds of times. The better player on that day has just an enormous chance of actually winning and not letting luck or boots determine that, you know, a four-hour match. Uh, so that, that's an over-determined event. An under-determined event might be something like the 72-hole golf tournament like the Masters. The reason you have so many different winners and that the same player, even if he's the best player in the world during a certain era, doesn't win all the time. It's just kind of underdetermined. 72 holes isn't enough time to examine every aspect of your game, to, to rule out the guy who shoots a bunch of 40 foot putts who isn't really that good and somehow wins. Um, and I would say that baseball has both of those extremes in the same sport. The 162 game season is as overdetermined and fair as anything in any sport. If you win a division or whatever over 162 games, you have really proved a lot. But then to turn that same sport down to five games in the first round, you have created a really underdetermined sport where fluke and luck and which hitter happens to be hot that way week and which pitcher slept on the wrong side of his bed and got his neck stiff or who's coming back from a cold. I mean, just all of this around umpires. And, and so you have a season that's built for fairness and a postseason that's built for thrills and easy rating. And that's not a criticism. To not have a 30 team sport like baseball and then, you know, just pick two teams to go straight to the World Series and leave 28 teams out and, 
have fans in 25 cities not even caring by August the 15th. You, you have to have, if you're going to have that many teams, and you should, then you have to have a multi-year coach season. But boy, does it set up two different sports. In football, not as bad, because when 300-pound guys are running into each other, you find out who's tougher. There, there are breaks, but it's not decided by things that are quite so little. And a seven-game NBA series, it's rare to see a seven-game series where you feel like the wrong team just flat out won by some stuff. <laughs> but in hockey, and yeah, yeah, I think maybe most in baseball, um, you, just, you go in scratching your head and, and you just hope that uh, over time uh, teams finally get there. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's part of what makes baseball so great. So, uh, going back to this Cubs series, Steven Strasburg pitched through illness in uh, in in Chicago, and he's just coming back from just all the time since he got drafted. People have been kind of questioning his toughness. So, do you think he's put all questions about his toughness and competitiveness to rest? And do you think uh, his performance here is the beginning of him becoming a DC sports legend? There's something called confirmation bias, which is really powerful. Once you take a public position with your friends on something, you say, I think this new zoning rule in our community is the worst thing that ever happened. If there's new information about it, it's really hard for people to publicly change their mind about it. And confirmation bias with Strasburg has always been any example of him missing time, going to the stable, but it's all put into this, this story that he just saw. But you got a fascinating thing now. If you start with the, the, 19, the 2012 season and go through the last six seasons, Strasburg ranks 25th in games started for all the He's a head of Felix Hernandez. He's right around David Price. He's a couple of starts behind Clayton Kershaw. But then you look at another guy on the map who's so thought of as super tough and he runs into walls and he plays with his head on fire, and that's Bryce Harper. And in the last five years, Bryce Harper in games played is 90. So the guy who gets hurt is Harper. The guy who cannot consistently be counted on to show up and play because he plays hard and gets hurt is Harper. That's not a criticism necessarily of his body or his attitude. It's simply the reality that he's average missing about 35 games. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you mentioned Bryce Harper. And now that the national season is over, he's entering the final year under his contract. Uh, how do you think the Nationals will fare if he leaves? And what do you think about the organizational stability that Mike Rizzo has built? Break the 
accident. And one of the people who runs the Dodgers always mm-hmm. said, it was like a big word, he says, is fungible. He's a brain tank. And that same $400 million he spent over 10 years for Harper, that a lot of offers with free agents on five year contracts. So when he issued to not sign Harper, it's not like he lost something enormous of the resource that money that he put into it will simply be used in different ways. And um, I, I change my mind on this every year. Harper, uh, he has on the side of the player season and plays third most of the year. He's number batting average ball by almost 100 points. You think you have to reevaluate this guy in his career every year. It's like a ritual. Um, and subject to change by next week. It now looks to me like he's more like a player. Um, if his production is, you know, four and four or four wins above replacement uh, through his first six seasons, and injuries are a part of his history. Uh, if he's getting hurt that much, this is the season in 1925. If you get him as a free agent from 26, will he really increase more than that in the first six years of his free agent contract? Will he really stay healthy more than that? So I think he's a wonderful player, but I think you're looking more at a seven or eight year contract for him. And uh, the talk about 10 year contracts and things like that, if that's, if that's where the discussion stays, I, I, I think the NASA would be wise to back off that. Um, but uh, Strasburg signed a seven year contract, that might be of being in Washington. And you never find out how much a player loves or likes an organization or teammates or a town or doesn't. Uh, until you come to free agency, uh, you know, the dollars, the dollar signs hit the road, and then you find out what the truth is. Uh, so I think Harper's happy in Washington. We have a, a home body. I don't think that New York would particularly suit him. I think Los Angeles, which is close to his home family in Las Vegas, I think Los, Los Angeles would have a good shot at it. So it'll be fascinating to watch, but I do think uh, that at those dollar levels, Replaced by multiple players, and his presence in the middle of the lineup be replicated. Maybe that's the issue. How much does the central real, really superstar hitter matter? And that's a tough one. But you know, Mike Trout's going to turn into that eighty one. I think he was the center of a good team. The Colts was still good for a few years. He hasn't really done anything. So it's a tangled, wonderful question. Why they? Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be uh, fascinating to see how all that works out with Bryce Harper and where he may end up playing in 2019. So, um, coming back to the current Nationals, do you think Dusty Baker, who is uh, now out of the contract, do you think he'll be back for 2018? Someone who can cope with personality, size, and you look 
around and say, well, who's, who's available? Are the Orioles going to be dumb enough to fire Buck Showalter? Um, I doubt that. The Red Sox just uh, fired John Farrell. He did win a World Series, but it was a, the team he inherited. He won it for a year. Farrell certainly good manager. But the question is, you know, got to be very good, very good manager in this debate. He may not be a great manager, but he's a very good one. And he will almost certainly get you back to the playoffs next year. It would be nice if his players would play better and not have five of his starters sit under 170 in the playoffs. Two of them sit 210. I think he would blame the manager. It would be nice if the players would play better. So I don't think there's any necessity to look for someone other than Baker unless somebody in the Nats organization has a really brilliant idea that I'm not aware of. And if Dusty Baker does return, he is already 68 years old, and his next contract will likely be his last. Do you think the Nationals have any coaches already within the organization that could eventually take the job? Mm, there was a time a couple of years ago when Randy Moore was seen as a, as a successor. I don't think that this is now a young, up-and-coming coach staff. Uh, Mike Maddox is a fabulous pitching coach, but that's what he wants to be. Uh, maybe those are the first space coaches in the seventh fifth-hour bench coach. Really good at that, but he's been stuck with the bench coach for 20 some years. Uh, they're not looking at a team that has an obvious internal solution. You know, and someday, 10 years from now, uh, Matt Weaver's would think a one of manager. He's brilliant, he's a catcher, he knows the game, he's good with people. Uh, maybe even someday, I'm not really sure, Jason works himself as a manager, and I'm not quite sure he would be controllable enough for an organization to want him to be their manager as much of a leader as he is. But there also is nobody sort of internal or a recent person who retired from the team three or four years ago as a manager. But they could have outside. All right, and then my final question is, uh, we recently saw the Braves fire their general manager, and we've heard Doug Harris is a name linked to them. And What do you think the odds are that he is named the Braves general manager, and what does that mean for the Nets and Braves moving forward if he does get the job? Okay, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. We'd like to thank Mr. Boswell for his time in talking with Drew. You can follow him in, on Twitter at Thomas Boswell. We apologize for rough spots in the audio. The recording didn't wasn't quite equal, so that's why Drew sounds loud, but we wanted to make sure that you could hear everything Mr. Boswell said. You can follow District on Deck on Twitter at District on Deck. Give us a like on Facebook. And of course, like and subscribe to our podcasts here on YouTube.